you hear Dr. Pietro Everall giving a presentation on the subject of cholesterol. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My name's Pietro Everall and my presentation is about cholesterol and it's a fascinating, if rather complex, topic. And that probably accounts for why, amongst our patients, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the role of cholesterol and about when and why it represents a health issue. To my mind, this largely results from the rather loose use of the word, particularly by journalists and others, that leads to cholesterol being perceived as a bad thing in the patient's mind. As doctors and nurses, we have to find a way of telling our patients exactly what cholesterol is, in simple terms, and why it's important, and that means going back to the basic science. It's long been established that cholesterol, by helping to move fat around the body, taking it to the organs that need it, is essential for health, that without it, the body wouldn't be able to function. But when it becomes oxidised or damaged, cholesterol can contribute to the build-up of plaque in the arteries, increasing the risk of heart disease and stroke. So, we often talk to patients about good and bad cholesterol as a way of avoiding more technical definitions. Because there are different types of cholesterol particles. For example, low-density lipoproteins, often called LDL particles, are more likely to become oxidised and contribute to build-up of plaque, whereas larger, high-density or HDL particles are less likely to. So the labels good and bad, although simplistic, can help patients to see that we need to look at the whole picture, rather than just focusing on the total amount of cholesterol in the body, and also that advanced lipid testing is important because it gives us information about the different types of cholesterol particles and helps us identify patients needing treatment. But patients can be reluctant to engage with the issue of cholesterol. As we know, when it comes to treatment, early intervention is key, but patients don't always see this. One thing they find hard to grasp is that although they feel perfectly fit and healthy, high cholesterol can be building up inside blood vessel walls, narrowing them and reducing blood flow to the heart and brain, thereby increasing the risk of cardiovascular problems. That's why it's imperative for those in high-risk groups – essentially men over 45 and women over 55, to have regular blood tests to measure not just the total amount of cholesterol in the blood, but also levels of HDL, LDL and triglycerides, a fatty substance similar to bad cholesterol. And preventive medicine has a key role to play here. It's estimated that 60% of adults in high-risk age groups have raised cholesterol levels – and whilst genetic factors are sometimes in play, 
In most cases, it's just the result of poor diet, obesity and lack of exercise, often reflecting the habits of a lifetime. So it's clear that we should be talking to younger patients about these issues too, and not just about diet and exercise either. There's research to suggest a link between stressful situations and how the body metabolises fat. And that's in addition to the fact that stressed out people are more likely to smoke or have poor diets. So we should be underlining the need for a good work-life balance, for taking regular breaks and managing stress levels in the workplace long before patients enter the high-risk demographic. Traditionally, statins have been the most commonly prescribed medication for high cholesterol, and that generally means a daily dose taken orally for life. Statins lower LDL levels by slowing down the production of cholesterol in the liver. But a new drug called Inclisiran works in a different way, targeting a gene that produces the protein PCSK9 to encourage the liver to absorb more bad cholesterol from the blood and break it down. As well as only requiring twice-yearly injections, making it much more convenient, the drug has fewer side effects, which, with statins, can include headaches and digestive problems. And studies show that treatment can reduce cholesterol by up to 50% in as little as two weeks. The drug's an example of what's called gene silencing. This is a unique mechanism that aims to disrupt the delivery of messages sent out by a gene that can cause illness, in the case of cholesterol, of the protein PCSK9. It doesn't touch the gene itself, an idea about which people do get nervous, and it bears no relation to things like gene editing, which also gets a bad press. The first such medication was a drug called Partizan that was licensed in 2019 to treat amyloidosis, and work is continuing on similar drugs that could treat things like Huntington's disease and preeclampsia. So in rolling out these injections to control cholesterol, we could be looking at the future of how all disease will be treated. <laughs>